Glory to Jesus. Glory to the Lord. What a magnificent praise that we brought to the Lord. Let's continue in our spirit of worship as we can read the same passage that was read at the first part of the service, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. In reverence and in a worshiping attitude and position of the heart, let's read a word because a continuation of all this worshiping. Therefore, Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, but by what it's called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now... But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing or destroying the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were off, far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of, household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit of God. Amen. Father God, open the eyes of our hearts. Help us understand the depth of your wisdom, the height of your love, the width of your graces, and bestow upon your people this morning, O oh, Spirit of wisdom and understanding that we, we, we will be enabled by your Spirit to comprehend, to understand, and to appropriate your blessings. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people say, Amen. Please be seated. I received a couple of texts. Say, let's see you, brother Romy, how you preach your 45 minutes message in 10. So this is a very deep passage as the whole uh, epistle to the Ephesians it's actually extremely deep and in a very few minutes that I want probably just to start with an introduction jump over the body and get you the conclusions. And I probably would need to apologize to the, apologize to the younger generation that this message is going to be just, you know, just the intro and the conclusions. But this is so important to understand that in this epistle, named, called, nicknamed by so many scholars as the epistle of the church. It is because in this, in these six short, very short uh, chapters, the Apostle Paul talks about the immensity of the divine blessings that we, the church, have been blessed. We've been bestowed by God, by our God and our Father in Christ Jesus. Uh, everything that we are and everything that we have, it is because of Jesus and it is, it is through Jesus, through His Spirit. And actually, Apostle Paul starts in chapter 1, and he is just, you know, like a, like a machine gun, just telling us so many of the blessings that we, the church, as corporate, as individuals, as families, 
All of these blessings, as verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And he says, verse 3, you're blessed in Christ. I want you to follow with me. Is the expression in Christ or in him, in Jesus, and through him. It's constantly because young folks, listen up. There's no blessing outside Christ. Hello? There's no blessing outside Christ. And we heard many uh, words in this, in this uh, church, and, uh, you know, about the, which are good. You know, financial blessings, material blessings, which are all good. But if you don't have Christ, it doesn't matter if you have millions and billions if you don't have Christ, you have nothing. And you will rot in, have, in hell. Paul says, verse 3, blessed, we are blessed in Christ. Verse 4, chosen in Christ and sanctified in him. Verse 5, predestined and adopted in Christ. Verse 7, in him we were redeemed and forgiven. Verse 8 through 9, in him we have wisdom, understanding, and purpose. Say it with me, purpose. If you don't have Christ, what's your purpose in life? What are you chasing? What's your goal? Verse 11, in him we have the divine inheritance. Verse 12, in him we have the hope of glory. In him, verse 13, we are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing else left outside Christ. You have no Christ. You have nothing. And we'll see how in uh, chapter 2, after in the beginning, in the verse 1 through 10, Paul, I'm watching the clock there, he's telling that the whole world was residing and was dying into, in Satan, the prince of darkness. We were by nature children of wrath, chapter, chapter 2, verse 3. Like the rest of the mankind, the whole of the mankind. And verse 4, but God. This is the biggest, the most important pivot in the whole epistle. But God. We were damned. We were lost. We were in a darkness. We were under damnation. But God, glory to Jesus. In Christ, he had mercy upon your soul. In Christ, he loved us. In Christ, he covered our sins, my sins and your sins and the whole world. But God, being rich in mercy. And then in verse 11, he starts focusing especially on the Gentiles. You know what Gentiles means? The whole world, from the biblical perspective, is divided in two. The Jews or the Israelites... And the rest of the world, the Gentiles, all the nations, all the rest of the tongues, peoples, races, and so on, Romanians and Americans. And verse 11 says, therefore, remember that one time you Gentiles, you Gentiles in the flesh, and 99.9% .9 in Ephesian church, they were Gentiles. Because they came from the world. They were not from the elected, chosen people of God. And here, if we could in one minute address this as Paul says, you were completely lost. The key word, actually in Greek, that five times is repeated is without. In Limba Romana, fura. Fura, Christos, fura. Without Christ, without God, without covenant, without promises, without nothing. And that's the key word. You had nothing without God. You were nothing without Christ. Without Christ, the Ephesians were worshipers of the goddess Diana. And before the coming of the gospel through Paul there in Ephesus, they were worshiping Diana. They had temples, monumental temples of Diana. Remember when it was there a, a problem in, in the plaza, central plaza in Ephesus? Those... Ephesians starting to yell out their hearts out, their minds out to Diana. Great is Diana! 
Remember that? Just to kind of try to cover the voice of the gospel. I myself, as you know, I said it many times from this pulpit, I was a pagan, I was a heathen, I was an atheist until the, the, the end of my military service back in Romania and Oradia. And some of you in the audience have bragging rights of being born and raised in a Christian family. I don't have those rights. But like those Jews, I don't care if you were born as a Pentecostal. I don't care if you were born as a Methodist. I don't care if you are born as an Orthodox or Catholic. You are without God. You need to have your personal encounter with the living Christ, with the resurrected Jesus. God does not have grandkids. I do have the 50s on a road. But God has only sons and daughters. He doesn't have grandkids or great-grandkids. If you are born and you were brought here and we prayed over you, the pastors, and you have now, you don't have Christ, you don't have a personal encounter with the living Christ, you are lost, the lost Pentecostal. Because if you not... If you don't have Christ, you have nothing. You have nothing. Without citizenship, without covenants, without hope, without God. These are three words that I was to expound on. That Paul continues in chapter 2 to explain the, the, the graces, the mercies of God. Through three words, separation, reconciliation, and unification. We were separated but he came, Jesus. But now, again, verse 213. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Glory to Jesus. For he, Jesus, is our peace. We were in an enmity. We were in a hostility. We were born enemies of God. But Christ, but God, but his love and his mercy... He died for us. He shed his blood. He is our peace. He took the hand of the father and he took the, the, the hand of the pagan, the heathen Romeo, and he said, you are father and son now through my work on the cross. This is our Lord Jesus. We don't want to preach anything except Jesus and him crucified. Because out of him, out of his work, we see how it's a flood of blessings that are coming upon us. Reconciliation. This is the greatest reconciling work in Christ, of Christ on a, on a cross. Sin is the greatest separator, separator in this world between God and the creation. Between Jews and Gentiles. Between husbands and wife, between a parents and prodigals. But God, but Christ. In Christ, the Jews and the Gentiles have become one. And he came thirdly to unify. Over and over we see how the you know, every time in exegesis we you 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 dissect the passage, you see the war, the words are being repeated. From 19 to 21, in the final part of the passage here, said Paul, Paul repeats about four or five times that he, the word one to emphasize the unifying work of Christ. We were made both one. One new man. One body. One spirit. Because in Christ we are called to be one. We are to be unified. There is no blacks and whites. There is only one race. And when we are moved by faith in the race whose head is Jesus Christ, there's no differences in tongue, in language, in nationality, in ethnicity, in color of the skin. In the body of Christ, we are all one. We are not from Bucharest, from Banat, from Cluj, Oradia, so wherever. We are one here, church, what the Spirit of God has to say. We are one nation, Paul says, one family, and one temple. I'm going to go to my conclusion, conclusing, conclusing thoughts. 
Because my beloved, I'm going to ask you to put on a screen the last, from 18 to, 18 and 19. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. I'm going to read them also. For through him, through Christ, we both, I mean, both mean the whole world, Jews and Gentiles, have access in one spirit to the Father, 19. So then you are no longer strangers. We are no longer aliens. We are of the household of God. We keep saying, and I'm going to say it this morning again. This is the greatest blessing and privilege of us being called with the name of God. Being the sons and daughters of the Almighty God. Yes, it's a, a beautiful blessing to be saved. But more than that, we are the adopted children of God. We are part of God's family. And every time we look at these elements, the bread and also the wine, Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, but over it every time we open the bread of life, the word of God, we are to be reminded, and the Holy Spirit reminds you and me, that we have access. Say with me, access. We have access to the throne. It was a wall of separations, my sins, your sins, between us and the Holy God. But now... The wall of separation was busted, was demolished. The blood of Jesus Christ created the unity between the Father's heart and us. When I, when I call the name of my Father, He hears you, He hears me. That gives us boldness in prayer. The prophetic word that came earlier in the day, was that we need to be bold in our faith. To start stepping into these promises. Without these promises, if we don't believe them, why are we coming here? For a good spectacle? For a good music? We are here to bask in the presence of the resurrected Christ. The same power that resurrected they rose jesus from the dead the same power holy spirit dwells in the church dwells in you and me when i when i bow my knee before the father he says i'm here tell me what do you want what's the desire do you want to be healed do you want your son and daughter to come back home just ask but ask with faith and this is what these sanctified elements this is what the word the living word of god is reminding us every time and every time we read that we need to remember we have access as sons i have four daughters i don't have sons but i have three sons now and i'm so blessed i'm a blessed man but every time and i'm a human being i'm a limited resourced man but every time one of my girls have come to me. Now even more if my grandkids come to me. But God doesn't have grandkids. But when my children come to me and they ask, Dad, can you help me? Can you intervene? I need this help from you. What do you think I'm doing? How much more? How much more God our Father is for you is for us he's ready and more than able because because has all the power and all the authority in heaven and on this earth to come and intervene in all of our situations let's boldly come before god our father in jesus name by the power of the holy spirit amen